presence here this morning. We want to experience you. And I pray that we would. Amen.
master forgave you, and regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be alone. Yeah. 
the church. It's great to see everybody. Why don't you grab a seat and uh, say howdy to someone as you do that. And here comes Mandy. Good morning, church. How you doing? Seems like everybody is excited today. I am Mandy Boom, and I am so happy. Actually, I'm happy to be at church today, and I am very excited that there are a lot of new people here. So if you are brand spanking new, you're just visiting, welcome. We are, we're glad that you're here to worship with us today. Uh, in fact, if you are new and you did grab a welcome brochure, I handed a couple of these out this morning, uh, we would really invite you to check it out. You can read what we're about, some of our visions and values, and there's a little perforated card here. Fill out whatever you feel comfortable sharing, and you can either uh, pop that in the offering as it comes around a little later, or you can bring that back to us at the welcome station on your way out. Uh, and it, it just allows us to connect with you in a personal way. Uh, so we know what you're all about, what you're looking and seeking for. Um, and if you didn't happen to grab one of those in the seat pocket in front of you, you will see a welcome card. Same thing. You can... Uh, just jot down the information and we'll connect with you. We'll also send you a rockin' uh, vineyard worship CD or an MP3 so you can uh, rock out on your way to work or school or the grocery store or if you're just driving around. <laughs> driving around with the top down. Yeah, I don't know about that now. Whew, a little too cold for that. Uh, also in the seat in front of you, there are a couple other cards. One is a giving card. Uh, this, if you want to fill this out, put that in the offering. It allows us to uh, inform you on some of the ways that you can give to the Ann Arbor Vineyard. Uh, and my favorite card is the prayer card. Every week, our staff prays for you. Whatever you write down on this card, whether it is, Jesus, I need help, I'm in pain, I'm hurting, or Jesus, what an awesome answer to a prayer we just, we want to raise that up for you. Um, so you can also jot that down and put that in the offering as well. All right, so let's talk about some of the haps at the vineyard. What's coming up? Slice of Life. Has anyone attended one of those yet? Yeah, they're pretty cool. Lindsay Balazer is the mastermind behind these. She's uh, so awesome at, at connecting people. And this is a great way to connect people. Every week we have a different theme. Um, what it's all about, the slice of life, pizza in the cafe, it allows people to share their stories. Our community is made up of so many different people from different backgrounds with great stories to share. Uh, and every week we're going to have a common theme of people in that, that realm gathering, sharing their stories. Today, educators, whether you are an educator uh, of preschool or daycare, college, anywhere in between. If you consider yourself a teaching or an educating professional, we would love to have you come, share your story, connect, and have some pizza. Who doesn't like pizza? Yeah, I didn't think so. I, I mean, that's like, you have to like pizza, right? Um, all right. Also, something pretty fun. Many people have extensive, fantastic to-do lists. Some people, I don't know, raise chickens. Some people have stamp collections. I used to have a chewing gum collection. Ew, I know, right? Uh, but some people are also so awesomely excited about Star Wars, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we are nearing the conclusion of our epic community-wide chain watch of the Star Wars films. Uh, come check out our final Star Wars film, Return of the Jedi, Saturday, November 21st at 6 p.m., Admission is totally free. Feel free to dress up. Sean Darth Walker. You thought it was Garth? It was a typo. It's Sean Darth Walker. We'll be there with his late saber. So anyway, come on and join us. It's a lot of fun. Um, also coming up, it's turkey time almost, right? Turkey, turkey. Um, Thanksgiving help is needed. We do such a cool thing every Thanksgiving. We serve upwards of 120 of our homeless friends uh, for an amazing, all-inclusive Thanksgiving meal. And we need your help. We do this collectively. If you can't help out the day of, 
you can still help. We can all figure out a way to help, whether it's cooking, preparing uh, maybe a pie. I heard some of you make some good pies. Clean up donations, driving. Yeah, Pete's going to make a pumpkin pie, I've heard. I just signed you up for that, Pete. Um, we need your help. I think we can all figure out a way where we can bring something in, time, money, food, anything. We really can need your help to pull this off this year. Um, sign up at the front in the gallery there. There is a table with a bunch of things, something will catch your eye, and we really hope that you can help us make it an awesome one this year. Um, and last but not least, one of my favorite days of the year, baptisms at the vineyard. What an amazing celebration. If you have never experienced one, they are face-melting awesome. They are so powerful and impactful and exciting, and I, I encourage all of you to make sure you are there. Even if you're not getting baptized, just be there to be part of it. It just is such an experience. But you know what? We do invite anyone that just wants a deeper connection, that you're just longing for more, please consider baptism. Um, I did it a couple years ago, and it was it was life-changing. It was an amazing experience. Uh, they are going to be held on December 6th, so please sign up. If you want to talk to somebody, I remember talking uh, to somebody about it before I did it, um, just the reasons and what it means, and maybe have a conversation with somebody. We have some awesome staff and pastors that would love to chat with you about it. Um, you can sign up at main office at annabervineyard.org or uh, in, in the lobby as well. So um, what I'd like to do now is, again, just turn your uh, attention here behind me. We have this pizza guy. Is there a pizza uh, PowerPoint? Oh, yeah. Actually, Nigel posed for that, our youth pastor. Yeah, youth director. He's super awesome. So anyway, uh, we just really want to make an effort to learn more about one, in one another and just stay connected. Um, and what we want to do is take a minute. We're, I'm going to have some people distribute some name badges, some little hello my name is stickers. Uh, you know, we serve a God that knows us by name, and we want to be a community where we know one, uh, each other's names. So if you wouldn't mind, um, just write your name. You know, the sweetest sound to a person's ears is their own name. And when you can even just learn a couple of people's names, it just helps us stay uh, connected as a community. Um, so here to talk a little bit more about Slice of Life and share their stories and hopefully uh, invite you to experience our slice of life if you are in the education field. Here is Yana and Sal. Let's welcome them. Hi, so my name is Yana, and I've been coming to the Vineyard for a long time. Um, I teach in a school that most of my students come from other countries. So I teach English as a second language, and I really felt when I was singing that song um, that God has really guided my steps to that school, and I get to share um, and show God's love to my students who come from different parts of the world. Some, you know, come from a good places, some come from really bad places, and um, I got to be their teacher every day. So I, I feel that I'm really, really blessed by that, and um, it has totally enriched my life as I've been working with these students, and um, I would love to talk to you more about that. So hopefully I'll see you after the service at the cafe. Here's that. Uh, the other day, or a couple weeks ago, Nigel mentioned how bright that light is right there. Let me tell you, it is very, very bright. So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sal Barrientes. May, some of you may have seen me doing the announcements last week and weeks past. Um, I am a middle school uh, teacher, uh, English language arts teacher here at a school here in Ann Arbor, Scarlet Middle School. And one of the things that I hope I can share with you is a little bit of my story. Um, after church, my wife and I have been together for over 20 years. We were high school sweethearts and all that good stuff. And we, we actually made it all the way through a tour with me in the Marine Corps and my wife traveling and doing things with me. And then me finally deciding to become a teacher and uh, bouncing around a little bit between Detroit and Belleville and finally 93 in Ann Arbor. But one of the things that I am so blessed to do every day is share experiences with young people and really teaching them the intangibles of life, um, how to have integrity and character and um, how to be eloquent and speak and do those types of things. So I'm hoping that some of you can uh, stop by after church today, have some pizza with us, and 
if anyone wants to talk uh, school or anything like that, we'd love to speak with you. Thank you. Thanks, Val. Nope. <laughs> well, good morning, church. Well, uh, it's good to be with you again this morning. If you are uh, here with us uh, for the first time or this is your 100th time, we're grateful that you're in our space. Whether you arrived here this morning uh, because you knew the way or because of an internet search or because someone invited you to join them this morning, we are grateful for your presence in our space this morning. We have a simple prayer that we offer for you. It's that you would experience peace, that you would experience welcome, that you would experience acceptance. We also pray that you would find space in this space to encounter the loving presence of the living God. Amen? Amen. Last week, we launched our four-part sermon series in Jonah. So if you didn't get a sermon handout, we'd invite you to do so. There should be some back there. Grab a Bible if you want. We're going to be hanging out in Jonah. It'll be on the screen, but it's always nice to have it in your hands as well. And what we want to do in this sermon series, uh, Nigel Berry, our youth director, is going to be joining me. He's going to be closing the sermon series on November 22nd, so you're in for a treat. He asked me to buy him a well costume so that he could preach in the well costume. So we'll see how that goes. It was $1,400, I told him, not this time. So what we're hoping to do as we hang out in Jonah last week, this week, and over the next several weeks is to really highlight the story of the God of second chances. That's all. That's what we want to do. Jonah was a successful, well-liked prophet in Israel. He ruled during the reign of the evil king Jeroboam. He was a political insider, having successfully prophesied that God would grant Israel military power, expansion, and growth. All of this favor from God in spite of Israel's refusal to adhere to the law of God and to be obedient to him. Now, having received a prophetic message, Jonah, that is, having received a prophetic message from God to preach against the wickedness and the sinfulness of the Assyrian Empire, Jonah decides instead to flee. He decides instead to flee from God, hoping uh, and hopping onto a ship that was headed for Tarshish, clear on the other side of the world. Why does Jonah flee? Well, he flees because he believes that God is being unjust. If Nineveh is evil, Jonah reasons, then it should be destroyed. What's the purpose, he asks, in his fleeing of God? What's the purpose of me delivering this message, this judgment in person, except for giving Nineveh a chance to repent? Did you happen to notice that in the original passage, in those first three verses, which detail the prophetic message that Jonah receives, there's not a call for Nineveh to repent. The call is, go and preach against their wickedness because finally it has reached me. Jonah may well be happy to go to Nineveh to preach that message, a message against the Ninevites, to announce their impending destruction, but Jonah has no interest whatsoever in creating space for Nineveh to repent. How did Jonah know? How did Jonah sort of intuit that God would forgive Nineveh if they repented? Well, all Jonah had to do was look around in Israel. He was a prophet in Israel at the time of a evil king. And yet God was still blessing Israel in spite of its sin. So it didn't take very much for Jonah to sort of posit that if God was willing to be merciful and compassionate to Israel, then that mercy and compassion could extend also to Nineveh. We'll hear as we go into chapter 4 next week, Jonah in his own words, but here's a little preview from Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 and 3. Jonah's irritated with God. 
I'm sure no one in this room has uh, any idea what could be wrong and why anyone would be irritated with God. But Jonah says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home in Joppa? That this is why I try to forestall, forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Because I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. I knew that you were going to be slow and abounding, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sinning your destruction. I mean, that's why Jonah flees. He intuits that God is going to extend the same mercy and compassion to Nineveh that Israel is experiencing. And Jonah, he did not want repentance in Nineveh. He wanted Nineveh destroyed. Anything less posed an existential threat to him and his people Israel. It's clear to me from Jonah's actions in chapter 1 that Jonah's allegiance is with Israel not with God. See, I would invite you as we try to enter the story that we would enter the story from Jonah's point of view. We typically read the story from God's point of view. He wants to do something in Nineveh and Jonah runs away and therefore Jonah is rebellious. But as we enter the story from Jonah's point of view, something starts to emerge. As someone who was under the foot of empire, Jonah knew that there was only one way to escape the advance of empire. The empire itself had to be dismantled. It had to be destroyed. The social and political and economic structures of empire has two goals. Expansion and destruction. That's what empire does. So if the Assyrian Empire wasn't going to be destroyed by God, then Jonah realized that Nineveh would eventually destroy him and his people and his country. So as we enter into the story from this point of view, that is, Jonah's point of view, then Tarshish starts to make sense, doesn't it? See, if Jonah's goal is to try to thwart God's mercy and compassion, then you can see why he wants to travel to the other side of the world. It takes over a year to get to Tarshish. So even if Jonah has a moment of repentance, he changes his mind, well, it's going to take another year to get back. He just bought his people two years. A lot can happen in two years. Meanwhile, there's no prophet in Israel for two years. There's no one to go to Nineveh to tell them about their evil and destructive ways. God would therefore have to follow through with his original command, which was to destroy Nineveh because of its evil. And since Jonah's alliance is with Israel, his fleeing is hopeful to me. His departure for Tarshish, it buys Israel some much-needed time. Let's return to the story, and we're going to pick up in verse chapter, or excuse me, in verse 4, we're in chapter 1. Then the Lord sent an, a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose that the sea was threatened to break apart. All the sailors were afraid, and they cried out, each to their own God. And they threw the cargo overboard because they were hoping to lighten the ship, give them a little bit more speed. Maybe they could outrun the storm that they're in. I think it's interesting, but in the second part of verse 5, it starts... But Jonah had gone down below deck where he fell into a deep and restful, dare I even say peaceful, sleep. The captain went to Jonah as the ship is being threatened to be torn apart and asked him a very simple question, how is it that you can sleep, Jonah? Get up, would you please, and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish here at sea. See, more than rebelling, Jonah's fleeing to Tarshish is an active form of willful disobedience. In resisting God, Jonah is hoping to change things. 
You know, as we study Jonah, many of us have been lulled into believing that Jonah flees because he's afraid of what's going to happen to him when he arrives in Nineveh. So his departure, therefore, becomes an act of self-protection. Nineveh was the enemy, and Jonah flees because if he delivers a message against them, maybe they will kill him as opposed to hearing it. Well, as I enter into the story, I see another path for us to go in. I see Jonah's fleeing as sort of an act of civil disobedience. It reminds me of the suffering that the protesters who sat in defiance of the law in the segregated lunch counters in the South. The protesters who were willing to endure verbal and physical abuse, having their food dumped on them, the beatings, the arrests, the threats, and the promise of death, because they believed that in their suffering, that their suffering could be used to convict the South and ultimately the entire nation of the immorality of the segregated laws of the South. See, Jonah had one goal in mind. His goal was to see Israel survive. Maybe by running, God will change his mind. Maybe God will find another prophet to deliver his message. Maybe God, and this is what Jonah wants, will just give up. Or maybe God will follow through and destroy Nineveh, just like he said he would. But let's go back. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 6. Did you notice something as we were reading through? That Jonah refuses to pray to God. The captain of the ship begs the sailors, each of them to cry out to their gods. And let me assure you that each of those sailors had a god of the sea. They were sailors. They made offerings to these gods so that they would have uh, safe passage. And so they're out there crying out to their gods, making offerings to their gods, and Jonah refuses to pray to his God. Jonah refuses because he's having an internal crisis. He's arguing with God about God's mercy and compassion. So he couldn't pray to God for help because he knows that God and he himself are the cause of the storm. It would have been disingenuous for God or for Jonah to speak to God at this point. He's stuck on this ship. He's stuck. Watch what happens next. We're going to pick up in verses 11 and 12. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. And so they, the sailors, asked Jonah, what should we do to you to make the seas calm down for us? Isn't it interesting how they have automatically now created you and me, us and them. What should we do to you so that life will be better for us? Jonah's stuck. He can't pray to God. He knows, hey, if I pray to God, this could all go away. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because he knows Nineveh's going to repent. He sees now he's not going to make it to Tarshish. So what does Jonah do in verse 12? He says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And it'll become calm, he says. See, I know that it is my fault that this storm has come upon all of you. Now, as the waves and the winds pick up and they continue to threaten this ship and these sailors, Jonah knows what's going on. Jonah isn't on board with, or God rather, isn't on board with Jonah's plan to disrupt his mercy and compassion. And Jonah knows full well that the reason and the cause for the storm is him. God is threatening these sailors be and their ship because of Jonah. So Jonah does a quick calculation. He recognizes God's power. He's just resentful about his own powerlessness. But he also sees that these sailors are innocent. If I'm no longer on this ship, the storm will pass. As I said last week, Jonah would rather die than go to Nineveh. Jonah would rather die than do what God has asked him to do. It also seems that Jonah would rather die than repent. 
Now when Jonah asks the sailors to toss him into the sea, he's hoping that this will save the sailors and that it will continue to disrupt God's plan of mercy and compassion for Nineveh. Because Jonah will be dead. No prophet, no message, no message, no repentance. See, I don't believe that Jonah believed that God would rescue him when he was tossed into the sea. Mm -mm. See, it's interesting to me also that the sailors find Jonah innocent. He's innocent in their eyes. So they're reluctant to do what he's asked them, which is to kill him. Verse 13. Instead, the sailors did their best to row back to land. Now let's just pause here for a moment and, and dive into the sea. See, the ancients believed that the sea was a place of evil and chaos. Powerful, mysterious. The sea they believed was completely and utterly outside of human control. So as this storm rages around and it surges around Jonah and the sailors, they were left with very few choices. They either need a miracle or they need an offering. Many ancients believed that monsters or gods or other forces of evil made their dwelling in the sea. So maybe an offering would appease the sea gods that lurk just below the surface. Determined to do what they believe would be right, they tried instead to use their strength to get back to dry land, to get back to safety, to get back to stability. Does this sound at all familiar to anyone? Interesting. Yet as they turned to their strength, they discovered what every great army and every people group that inhabits a coastline already knew. The sea is too powerful, too mysterious to be controlled. Having prayed to their gods and not received an answer, having implored Jonah to do the same, they were out of options. They could not row back because the sea grew wilder before them. So, the sailors didn't want to die. They also didn't want to kill anyone. So they were in the middle of this disagreement between Jonah and God. And since Jonah refused to pray to his God, they did what Pontius Pilate did with regard to Jesus. They took a basin of water. They washed their hands. They picked Jonah up and they threw him overboard. Now the story should have ended right there. Jonah would have died. Presumably, these sailors would have continued on their journey to Tarshish, delivered their cargo, and enjoyed a night, because they have Jonah's money, on the town, drinking and retelling the story of the guy they had to throw overboard on their way. It's also likely that Nineveh would have been destroyed. Jonah should have died. And right here is why I think the story of Jonah is the story of the God of second chances. Jonah should have died. But here Moses in Exodus chapter 34, who reveals who God is to us. God is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. He's slow to anger, abound, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Turning again to Jonah, let's read the last verse of Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish, a whale, a worm, we don't know, to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of this fish three days and three nights. See, I believe that Jonah had no idea that God had purposed a large fish to rescue him. Now, some of us have been taught that Jonah's faith was so strong that he knew that if he was tossed overboard, God would rescue him. 
provide a way for him. He was confident that he could just be tossed in the sea and God would be his provider. You know, I've always struggled with this traditional way of seeing the role of the whale in the story. As a matter of fact, I don't really like talking about the whale in the story, but the whale is present in the story. We cannot ignore it. If Jonah wanted to stop the storm, if he wanted to reverse his fortunes, all he had to do was repent. Repenting for Jonah also meant he had to accept God's mercy and compassion, not only for himself, but for his enemies too. Yet Jonah does not repent. More than that, it's striking to me that Jonah doesn't repent at all in this story. He doesn't repent on the ship. He doesn't repent in the whale. He doesn't repent in Nineveh. Jonah doesn't repent at all. In telling the sailors to toss him overboard, I believe Jonah was content to die. He would rather die than repent. Friends, that's how deep and abiding his disappointment and anger, frustration and irritation, both with his enemy and God, was. The whale wasn't sent to punish Jonah, but to create space and to give Jonah another chance. Let me push in here for a moment. While Jonah was rescued from drowning, he wasn't really free. He's sort of trapped in a state of limbo, if you will. Now, my wife reminded me that limbo has its own special meaning, so let's not refer to it as limbo. Let's consider this Jonah's timeout. Jonah has a three-day, three-night timeout, courtesy of God. Three days and three nights is a lot of time. Time to consider the extent of the situation in which he finds himself, how he got here. Time to sit in this timeout in frustration and with his frustration. Time to sit with his suffering. Time to sit with his pain and disappointment and time also for gratitude to emerge. And that's what we see in chapter 2 of Jonah. Let me just take a commercial break and tell a story. Because Jonah is a really, um, it's a wonderful passage of scripture. It's a, I think it has a lot to tell us, but it can be hard for us individually to identify with Jonah. Uh, Many of us are not here this morning fleeing God. You wouldn't be in the house of God if you were fleeing him, right? Maybe. I hope not. I don't know. I don't know how you're fleeing. Hope you would find God here. That's where I was going with I hope not. Not that it would be a good place, thank you, for uh, hiding out. I should just stay on my notes. So here's the story. Shortly after I reached the age of consent, I grew up in, the Was- in Washington, D.C., I decided that it was time for me to move out of my mom's house. This was a, a really difficult and uh, painful decision that I didn't enter into lightly. I prayed about it. I sought counsel about it. I agonized over it for months. But I believed that my decision to leave was the right decision for me to make at the time. Now, at 16, I didn't have a... Uh, My frontal lobe wasn't fully developed, and so I didn't have the ability to look at long-term decision-making. It was more impulse, right? That doesn't come to 25. And so I wasn't really concerned about how my decision would impact others, my mom, um, my brother, anyone else who may have been affected by that. I just knew I couldn't maintain the status quo any longer. Something in my life had to change. Now, as I look back on the time, I can see a little bit more clearly all of the sort of components that went into my decision to emancipate myself. I was hurt, I was disappointed, I was angry. I I felt as if my um, innocence as a child had been lost. And now as I look back, I see that there was some bitterness that was present there as well. And so what I'm learning is that bitterness can bind us especially if we cling to the bitterness. It can trap us. 
it can hold us forever in a cycle of brokenness and disappointment. Because behind every interaction, every relationship, everything, there is something to inspect to see how someone is taking advantage of you and manipulating you and controlling you. See, bitterness can prevent us from reaching out from God because we may actually believe that God is the party responsible for the hurt and the pain and the disappointment in which we're experiencing, so we don't feel comfortable to talk to him about it. All of this preventing us from allowing ourselves to fully become who we should be in God, robbing us of life and harming those around us. Now, it took time in my story. Uh, it took years, actually. But I was able to finally realize that bitterness was sort of robbing me of life and that I wasn't going to be able to move forward until I was willing to create space for reconciliation with my mom. And it wasn't an easy road. It hasn't been an easy road, even today. But there's something about being vomited on dry land that gives us an opportunity to take some steps towards a new beginning. Jonah is trapped in sort of this state of this time out. In this very tight space, he's wrestling with a lot of things. And maybe one of the things that Jonah's wrestling with is his bitterness. And so I see that in offering a prayer of thanksgiving, Jonah breaks the cycle just a little bit and expresses gratitude. For Jonah, it seems as if it's a way of breaking the power of his disappointment and his frustration and his hurt. Now, having said that, I just want to caution us to be careful not to interpret Jonah's prayer as some kind of key that unlocks his time out. I'm an engineer. I see solutions everywhere, often where there are not solutions or formula, right? Sort of as if Jonah is this wayward child who, at the end of his time out, is asked by God, like every parent to the child, do you understand why you had a time out? Are you ready to apologize and do what I've asked you to do? We're going to find out as soon as we get to chapter 4 that when Jonah arrives in Nineveh, he's still mad. He doesn't want to be there, and he's certainly not repentant. He's not repenting for fleeing God. But there's something we have to focus on, which is he's in Nineveh. It's the first step among many. I see Jonah's willingness to die when he asked the sailors to toss him overboard as a sort of sacrifice offered to God. But God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he rejects Jonah's sacrifice. Twice, while Jonah is trapped in the well, he mentions God's holy temple. What's Jonah getting at here? Is this a metaphor for God and God's divine presence? Or is he referencing the temple that's found in Jerusalem, the place where the ancients believed God's presence dwelt among them? Is this a shift that we're witnessing in Jonah's posture? Is he no longer interested in dying? Is he signaling to himself and to God that he hopes to survive this time out in the whale and live on? Well, it reminds me, just a little bit of what happens to King Saul in Israel when God rejects him as king. Found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, 22, the prophet Samuel, another prophet by the way, comes to Saul and says to Saul, after Saul just sort of ignores what God asks, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as he rejoices in obeying him? And then Samuel gives us this beautiful line here, to obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better 
than what they believed God wanted, which was the fat of the rams that they were offering. See, even the best of us would prefer sometimes to sacrifice than to obey. King Saul refused to obey and was rejected by God as king over Israel. And here in this story in Jonah, Jonah gets a second chance. Friends, I love this story. This has been a fun, fun time. Let me offer um, a practical tip. The band can make their way back. I think Joan Bernard's going to lead us in communion, so you can head up as well. The, I'm not going to forget the offering. I don't even do the offering, Pete. Sean does it, so you don't even have to worry. For the practical tip, what I wanted to, to do, because I see a lot of things at work here in Jonah, and I think there, there's a way in which we can enter into Jonah and try to reduce it to just a couple pieces. And I just want us to swim and sit a little bit more in the complexity. But as you read chapter 2, and I put it on the handout with our sort of three-column discovery uh, page, I put the whole psalm of thanksgiving there. Because I think we often read it as a repentance prayer. And that that becomes a key that unlocks Jonah's time out. But if it is, it's a shady one, man. I mean, it's the shadiest repentance prayer ever, in so much that he doesn't actually repent. And then there, there's some factual things that you can wrestle with in there, right? Who tosses Jonah into the sea? The, way, the sailors, but Jonah attributes it to God, right? So there's some wrestling that's going on already in the passage. But here's what I want it to offer, which is that you all take the week, that we would take the week, considering Jonah's prayer of thanksgiving that he offered in the well, and ask yourself a simple question. Where are you experiencing gratitude? See, in the culture that we live in, the empire that we live in, this empire tells us to focus on everything that's going wrong, everything that is broken, all of the things we want that we're longing for that we don't have. And what I see is a very simple invitation from Jonah, which is to shift our focus towards gratitude. What if we thought of gratitude as a tool, a gift actually, from God to help us live in a world that's not the way it should be. That's what I see as I process and wrestle with Jonah, and that's what I'm inviting you to do with the um, Discovery Bible Study this week, is to rewrite that psalm of thanksgiving as a song of thanksgiving that you might offer to God. It doesn't ignore that life is tough and things are difficult and the world is not operating the way that you want it to be. I am still trying to be 5'9". I continue to ask God for two more inches of height, and he has not answered my prayer. Right? I joke because we can all laugh about that one, right? Because I'm a short guy. Someone mentioned, you look really tall on the stage. And I was like, yeah, it's the lights. All right. We have uh, two prayer insights, uh, two sets of prayer insights for you. We have a prayer station over here to my left, your right. We have trained prayer uh, ministers who'd love to pray with you this morning as you're in celebration. Before I go into the insights that they receive, I just want to say if you're here this morning and you're in, in, you're in pain at any level for anything, we'd love to pray for your healing. Often when we ask God for prayers of healing, he answers. And in our prayer station, we've seen a number of people healed from significant things to very small things. So it doesn't cost you anything to ask for healing this morning, but you may receive a gift of healing. So I would invite you to do that. The insights uh, that I want to share with you, this one is a picture. And so these are just images just to help. And if they uh, relate to anything that might resonate with you, you can come over and share with the person praying for you that that picture was for me, and they'll pray along. This one was a blackbird uh, who's stealing all of your seeds, either seeds of hope or physical resources. And so this would be a prayer to sort of get this bird out of your life right now. Uh, two, there's someone in a prison of darkness, sort of like being trapped in a timeout, um, and God's uh, word is available to set you free and to give you hope. And so we want to pray a prayer of blessing into that. And then my wife, Maria, had a couple prayer insights that I wanted to share with you. 
Uh, one is there are some of us who might be here this morning who have been harassed, wounded, or oppressed to the point where we can't forgive. It's almost physically impossible. It would be better for us to die than to extend God's forgiveness to the other. And so if that's you this morning and you would like to allow God into that space to break some of that, uh, we'd love to pray for you uh, this morning. And then secondly, there's someone who's here this morning who's actively ignoring or one, running away from something that God has directed you to do. Unless, of course, he's asked you to leave our church and then talk to me about that. No, I'm joking. That's the, the pain of the pastor, right? Um, the person, you have tried to outrun God, and you haven't made very much progress. And the offer for prayer is that um, instead of fleeing God, what if you ran into God's loving embrace? Because God accepts you even though you want to flee from him just as you are. But you have a fear that you won't be accepted. You have a fear that you're going to be rejected because you've been running away. And so it's almost like just receiving a holy hug from God. Amen? So as I said, Sean, uh, Sean's going to lead us in our time of offering Pete, and uh, so you can get yourselves ready for that. After Sean leads us through the doxology, Joan Bernard's going to come and lead us through a time of communion. Sean? So there's a few details. Uh, there's cards in the seat back in front of you. You can take some of those out and fill them out right now. There's a welcome card and a giving card and a prayer card. So if you fill those prayer cards out, uh, myself and Pastor Donnell and the rest of the staff will pray for those this week. We're also going to give money now. So if you can do that, please do. There's a few ways to do that. You can put cash or checks in the offering bags as they go by. If you don't have any of that and you'd like to give by credit card, there's a giving kiosk out in the lobby that you can use. Or you can go to our website, annarborvineyard.org, and click on the Give tab at the top of the home page. So let's take a, a second here to fill those cards out. If you happen to have already filled them out, you can just silently reflect on whatever you wish. So let's take a few seconds to do that. Let's pray now for the offering. Jesus, thank you for everything that you provide for us. In every way, Lord, give us hearts of thankfulness. This is the thankful time of year. Help us to uh, flow in that easily as possible, God. We want to give some of our uh, money back to you right now, Lord. And we pray that you'd use these gifts to let the hungry be fed, the lonely be comforted, to bless those that are in need. And we pray that you would be greatly trusted and praised as we give. We ask this in your name. Amen. So let's stay seated as we take the offering and we'll sing the doxology together. Praise God from blessings flow. this morning and a special warm welcome to our newcomers. We would like to let you know that our communion table is open to all. So please feel free to come on down and join us as we celebrate in the Lord's Supper together. Our communion meal is comes in a cup inside of a cup. On the bottom is the bread of life and on the top is the fruit of the vine. If you require a gluten-free option, that's available 
the right hand side. Um, be sure to ask for it and let us all stand for communion. I'm going to start with a scripture verse and then I'm going to go through a short prayer and then we'll join in the Lord's Supper together. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. The cup of the blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in one bread. We still our minds and draw our hearts so near to yours, and find that we're sat with true whole friends at a meal with open doors. Your invitation is to all to come and eat for free. You have paid the bill. Your resurrection life we will receive. As I glance around the room and see so many things, the tears of pain, the smiles of joy, the hopes, the dreams, the fears, upon these gathered, young and old, the followers of Christ, that come to take the bread and wine to remember your sacrifice. And in this moment, all is clear from beginning to end. From your birth in Bethlehem to your death on the cross and your resurrection in the Garden of Gethsemane, we build our lives on yours, Jesus, on a love that never ends. We carry a promise in our heart, a gift of peace, that those who put their trust in you in eternity will meet. Welcome to the Lord's table. Let's do the Lord's Prayer together, all right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us today our, our daily, daily bread, bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We can come down two lines down the center aisle for communion.
bit plenty of room in your lives. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus. Thanking God, the Father, every step of the way. Amen. Amen. Have a good week.